Yes. Thank you, and we do appreciate appreciate Emily Miller filling in and being on the bench for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and another word of personnel announcement, uh, our pastor is home ill with sickness this morning, and so we're lucky to have Randy Ridenauer who will be filling in in a few minutes. Well, it's been another interesting week in Oklahoma, um, but it's good that I think that we can gather together in this safe space called North Haven. Welcome to you and welcome to those of you that are worshiping with us online on Facebook. And Jacob, please get well. So welcome. Many of you, like me, probably were out replacing bedding plants this weekend that had been in the ground all of 10 days and were ruined by the hail. Um, and, and as I was re-mulching, uh, I was thinking that uh, I'm good with gardening when I can use a lot of mulch to cover up the imperfections. When I'm inside, I'm good painting when I can cover up imperfections with spackling. Uh, but happily, when I come on Sundays to worship, I don't have to bring my mulch and my spackling because I'm here to meet a God that welcomes and greets me just as I am, greets us just as we are without our mulch and our spackling. So welcome, and I'm looking forward to worshiping together. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for joining the, us this morning. Thank you for leading us. We know that we'll leave better from the words we hear and the songs we sing. In your son's precious name, amen. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Let's stand as we sing together. second switcheroo of the day from Jillian Mitchell. Um, okay, 
Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his, humiliation, in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does this prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak. And starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is the water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he, pro he proclaimed the good news to all of the towns until he came to Caesarea. The word of the Lord. John, <clears throat> pardon me, John Oxenham's real name was William Dunkerley. He ran a successful wholesale grocery company in Manchester, England, and served as a deacon in a congregational church. He was also a writer, working for newspapers and magazines, and like many journalists, he longed to do more creative work. Fits with the day, doesn't it? <laughs> He wrote the lyrics to our next hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West, as part of a book which he published in 1908. He also published under the pseudonym of Julian Ross. Uh, whatever his name, this, this author was ahead of his time in presenting these sentiments that we'll sing against racial prejudice. We still struggle with racial and national divisions today and still need to hear this message of unity. Let's stand as we sing. In Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great fellowship everywhere their high communion find his service is the golden cord close binding all the mankind join hands then brothers of the faith whatever your race may be who serve my father has a son is surely kin to me in christ now meet both east and west in him meet south and north all christly souls are one in him Got wrangled into doing a lot. Let's, let's pray.
Lord, we come to you today, and we thank you. We thank you for the faces here, for those not here. For the changes that happen, be with us, help give us purpose, or help others give us purpose. Amen. I'm gonna live. I'm gonna live so, so God, God can, can use me. God can use me anytime, anytime, and anywhere, anywhere. I'm gonna live. I'm gonna live so God can use me anytime, anywhere, anywhere. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna pray so God can use so me. God can use anytime. Me. Pray. I'm gonna pray so, so God, God can, can use me anytime and anywhere, anywhere. I'm gonna sing. I'm gonna sing so, so God, God can, can use me. God can use me anytime and anywhere, anywhere. I'm gonna sing. I'm gonna sing so, so God, God can use me anytime. I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work so God can use so me. So God can use anytime, and anywhere, anywhere. I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work so God can use me anytime, and anywhere, anywhere. Anytime and anywhere, anywhere. Good job. On that note, <laughs> and hopefully you could hear the words of the song, we have a few announcements um, really dealing with you and how God can use you. Um, so, well, first, he can use you to come to our end of the school year bash, which is May 21st, 430 to 830. That's birth to death. Okay, so if you fit anywhere in that category, then... Yay, you're welcome. Be ready to be wet and just to be together outside and having fun. We are also planning a summer of lots of fun things, not just this bash. Um, we're also going to have some movie nights planned. There will be an intergenerational event, which will be like a VBS for everyone, not just the kids. So look for more information. We're still planning. <laughs> and then finally, the last shameless plug oh okay all right we need you we need you and if you're wondering if i'm talking to you the answer is yep yep i am yep i need you um if you are wondering where you could plug in right where you could find meaning where you could find purpose fellowship and lots of love and maybe a few runny noses um we have a place for you, and it's called Kids Haven. Uh, and we're getting started. We, we were going to go back to Sunday school, like somewhat sort of normal. Um, and we need you. So um, if you are willing to volunteer, we will be having a sign-up sheet, or you can just come talk to us. If you don't, I literally am going to call you people, okay? So there's no shame on that. But if you're curious, we're going to have a training event in two Sundays? Two Sundays. So May you can 16th. come learn more about what we're going to be doing. And Even if you just want to know what's going on, you're more than welcome. Absolutely. So that's all we have. And the children can come to Children's Church with us if you're ready. Woohoo!
I'd known I was going to be preaching, I would have brought a Bible. <laughs> Will you pray with me? God of grace and wholeness, all around us we see pain and heartache, the effects of fragmented and broken systems, communities, and families. When the pain of others becomes too much for us to bear, we often respond by building up walls that separate us from the world. And so here we stay safe and secure behind our walls of division, seeing only ourselves, our own problems, and our own hopes. We boast of our love for humanity while at the same time fail to see the needs of our neighbors. But God, you have called us to be your people, and you have given us a new commandment, the commandment to love one another. Love, though, is something that we cannot do from a position of safety and security. For to love is to embrace vulnerability and risk, all for the sake of the beloved. So guide our hands to reach out across our walls and open our eyes to see beyond ourselves so that we might be used by you for the healing of this world. In the name of Jesus Christ, who called us to be in the world but not of the world, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, that was a wonderful piece of music by uh, uh, Pamela and Caitlin. Uh, that's likely to be the high point of the service. It's all <laughs> Maybe I'll be downhill from here. <laughs> And, and Kaylee, thank, thanks for reading that, that very long passage about which I have absolutely nothing to say this morning. <laughs> so if I'd been thinking, I would have changed. So, so I'm going to read two, two other passages of Scripture. Uh, first from Micah chapter 4, this is verses 6 through 7. And Micah writes, In that day, says to the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. The lame I will make the remnant, and those who are cast off a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion, now and forevermore. <clears throat> and, and this is from John's first epistle, chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. John writes, God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. <clears throat> I uh, have all my sermons up in the cloud, so, so when necessary, if somebody tells me, I, I can pull one down uh, easily. <laughs> The, the, it's good news and bad news. Good news is I have a sermon. Bad news is if you've been here at North Haven a while, you probably already heard it. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to uh, look through and, and say, okay, which is the one that uh, uh, is probably the one that I've not recently done. Uh, another piece of bad news, this, this may be like my most controversial sermon. Uh, so so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Ser sermons, like medication, should probably come with warning labels. So, to, to be honest, some of mine over the years should have been labeled warning, empty calories, contains no nutritional value whatsoever. Uh, others, probably maybe most of them, uh, would have had the familiar label, warning, may cause drow drowsiness, do not operate heavy machinery. So, my goal is... Today is this label, warning, thinking, and theological reflection ahead may cause pain and discomfort. So I'll let you judge which label, or maybe combination of labels, this sermon deserves. I'll tell you, though, that it may be somewhat controversial. 
So over the years, I've discovered that the secret to a controversial sermon is to first have a good joke. And then second, to proceed the controversial section with something that's so boring that by the time you get to the controversy, half the congregation is asleep. And the other half is still thinking about the joke. So we're going to spend some time talking about issues of translating ancient manuscripts. Uh, but first, we'll, we'll get the joke. So a comedian, Emo Phillips, is credited with writing this classic, uh, which was voted in a recent contest as the best religious joke of all time. He writes, once I saw this guy on a bridge about to jump, and I said, don't do it. He said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? He said, yes. I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, a Christian. I said, me too. Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. I, I said, me too. What denomination? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, what a coincidence. Me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, wow, that's great. Me too. Northern Conservative, Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative, Conservative Baptist Eastern Region? He said, Northern Conser Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region. I said, wow, that's just amazing. Me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. I said, die, heretic, and I pushed him over. <laughs> it, it's a funny joke. And, and like most good jokes, it captures something true. In this case, disturbingly true about our history as Christians. North Haven is a church in the Baptist tradition uh, the history of which began when its first church was founded in 1609. That church split in 1611. And, and today, according to Oxford's World Christian Encyclopedia, there are over 33,000, not Christian churches, but Christian denominations in the world. 30, 33,000 Christian denominations. And each one of those Christian denominations probably started because of some church split. Why, why do these church splits occur? Well, many of them occur sadly because of power struggles within the church. There are others, though, that occur because of genuine theological disagreements. Then the question becomes, why are there any real theological disagreements between Christians if both parties believe that the Bible is the authority in matters of faith? Well, disagreements should be easily settled with an examination of the Scripture. In the words of a bumper st sticker that I see very often in this part of the country, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Just open the Bible and see what it has to say on the matter. But then we have another problem. Which Bible do we open? So in the room this morning, we probably have several different versions available to us. You may have the New International Version or the King James Version. I, I was at an uh, exercise uh, where I got uh, paired off with a chaplain's assistant that, uh, that wasn't my usual chaplain's assistant, and so I started asking him questions just to get to know him. And, and he said he came from a King James-only church. And, and I was kind of curious why somebody would, uh, uh, not curious why somebody would like the King James Version. It's, it's one of the, the beauties of, of uh, English literature. The, the language is, is just beautiful. Uh, but why I think that was the only valid translation? And, and he, he told me, he said, well, let me put it this way. He said, uh, uh, your version contains the Word of God. My version is the Word of God. <laughs> uh, to which I said, that, that's nice. <laughs> I just didn't, didn't, didn't exactly know what to say. So, so but we have New, New American Standard Bible, maybe. We, you may have the English Standard Version. Uh, my, my preferred translation that I usually carry is New Revised Standard Version, but I don't think it's perfect. Um, there's the message. So, but all of these and many, many more. In, in fact, there have been over 250 different English versions published since 1881. 
Uh, that was the year that a scholarly edition of the Greek New Testament was, text was published. And, and some of these different versions are just attempts to communicate the text in different language for different audiences. And, and that's absolutely something that we always need to be doing. Uh, so differences in wording in those cases are probably just not important. It's the same meaning in different language. But there are some differences that are more substantive. For instance, New Revised Standard Version and New American Standard Bible translate 1 Thessalonians 5.22 as abstain from every form of evil. The New International Version says avoid every kind of evil. There's no real difference in meaning there. But the King James translates 522 as abstain from all appearances of evil. That's much stronger than either of those other two translations. Uh, another example is 1 Timothy 6, uh, chapter, or verse 10. Paul says the love of money is what? Most contemporary translations say a root of all kinds or all sorts of evil. But the King James Version says it's the root of all evil, period. Finally, look at Acts chapter 8, 36 through 38. Actually, I do have something to say about that passage. I didn't, didn't think about it. Uh, F Philip meets an Ethiopian. <laughs> okay. It explains to him that a passage in Isaiah is speaking about Jesus. In, in verse 36, the Ethiopian sees some water and asks, what's to prevent me from being baptized? In verse 38, they stop, and Philip baptizes the Ethiopian. There's no real difference between versions, Bible versions, in either of those verses. The difference is verse 37. NRSV and NIV just completely skip verse 37. If you, if you look at your, uh, your Bible, it'll go from 36 to 38. The NASB and the King James Version both contain verse 37, which reads, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God. So why, why are there these differences? Well, the real reason is that translating the Bible is just hard. Um, any translator faces some serious problems. First, the good news. We have over 5,500 early manuscripts of the New Testament. Manuscript P52 is probably the oldest that we have. It contains five verses from the Gospel of John and was copied about 30 years after John's gospel was written. The earliest complete New Testament we have is Codex Sinaiticus from about 350 AD, and that's about 250 years after the last books in the New Testament were written. That sounds really bad, 250 years, until you consider that we have only 49 early copies of the works of Aristotle. And the earliest was made roughly 1,400 years after Aristotle died. Now, we don't generally tend to question that this, whether or not this was Aristotle's work. Uh, but the Christian New Testament is in far better shape, as far as a manuscript tradition, than any other ancient work in existence. It's by far the best verified ancient work in existence. There's nothing else that comes remotely close. That's the good news. Now the bad news. Well, we have none of the originals, we only have copies. And we try to reconstruct the original from the evidence of the copies. But no two copies that we have are exactly alike. The scribes were human beings who made mistakes like we all do. Common mistakes were skipping lines, especially when two adjacent lines began with the same words. Uh, they would go back and say, oh, that's the line I was on, because it starts with those, but, and you end up uh, skipping a line. Sometimes whole sections were skipped, uh, especially when they're lines that ended with the same words. There were also instances when it looks like the scribe tried to improve on the original text. The ending of the Gospel of Mark is the best example. Before you decide to demonstrate your faith by drinking poison or handling snakes, you might want to first meet me for coffee in a conversation about the manuscript history of the Gospel of Mark. But there are other problems besides simple scribal errors. The first is just reading the manuscript itself. Usually when I preach this, I'll put some slides up on the board. Uh, but but uh, one of those slides I have is a page from Codex Sinaiticus. Remember the, the earliest complete work that we have. 
Uh, there's more missing from the pages than what is there. And the text that is there now at this point, no surprise, it's faded and, and impossible to read in spots. It looks pretty bad. Uh, it's nearly 1,700 years old. Uh, another case is that earliest fragment that we have from the Gospel of John, which is P52. That's the oldest known document containing part of the New Testament. It's papyrus, which ages a lot better than, than a paper manuscript, uh, but it's only got a few verses. They're easy to read, but it's not very long. It's just a fragment. Uh, another is what's called Codex Alexandrinus. Um, it's a good problem of another problem with ancient manuscripts. We can see the text really well, but the text is still really hard to read because there's no space between the words. There's no punctuation. There's absolutely nothing to signal the beginning or end of sentences. The scribe would simply copy letters until they cut to the end of the line, and then they continue on with another line. Uh, because the, both the papyrus manuscript and paper, it was so precious that you didn't waste a spot of it. Uh, just fill the whole page with letters. And, and it makes the text really difficult to read, even if it's in a language that we know well. An another problem for translation is punctuation. Greek scribes didn't begin using punctuation until somewhere along the 8th or 9th century. So if you're a translator, you have to make a judgment call about where to put punctuation. Opening quotes are usually no problem because the quotation will generally follow something like he said or he asked. The closing quotes can be tricky, though. Where, where does this quotation end uh, as opposed to uh, just continuing on? Uh, consider this famous passage from John. Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? You may recognize this from John chapter 3. Uh, that's verse 10. Verse 11 goes on, very truly I tell you, we know that what's coming up here is a quotation, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lift, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Well, the closing quote, does it go after verse 15, which ends with, uh, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life? Uh, that's how the Revised Standard Version ends it. Or does it go after all the way to verse 21, including that famous John 3.16? That's how it is in the New International Version or the New Revised Standard Version. In other words, the question that we're asking here is John 3.16, a verse that probably everyone knows, is it a quote from Jesus or is it an editorial comment by John? There's absolutely nothing in the manuscripts that helps us make that decision. The placement of commas is also a problem for translators. And some decisions about where you put commas really have theological implications. In Luke 23, 43, most versions have Jesus telling the thief on the cross, truly I say to you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. The New World Translation places the comma after today. Truly I say to you today, comma, uh, you will be with me in paradise. Now, why does that matter? Well, there, there are some groups that believe in a doctrine called soul sleep. That is, upon death, a person ceases to exist until some future time when that person is recreated by God. Um, so if you believe in that, you don't want it to say, truly I say to you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. You put the comma after, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, after today. Uh, there are other times, though, when the problem is not punctuation, but it's about the meanings of the words themselves. For instance, Genesis 1.26 reads, then God, let us make, uh, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Genesis 4.25 says, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. Well, that word knew in that context presents another translation difficulty, uh, but we'll just let that one go. So... 
Should we translate a word into its English counterpart, or should we translate the concept or thought? That, that's another problem that translators have. Now, when the text says that Adam knew his wife, I, I don't think that it's saying that Adam could pick her out of a lineup. Well, the Hebrew word for man or human is Adam. So when does it mean a man, and when does it mean a particular man? Adam, with a name. Uh, some versions start using it as a proper name in chapter 2, verse 7, others at chapter 2, verse 17, others at chapter 2, verse 19, 2, 20, 3, 17, 3, 21, and still others all the way to 4, 25. Okay? So, so again, it's a perfectly good translation, but you, you're making, the translator is making a judgment call. And, and no matter their level of knowledge of the original language, the translator still has to make judgment calls about how to translate the text. So how do we make the judgment? How do we decide when a word means one thing and not another? First thing that we do is we look at the usage of that word in as many different contexts as possible. Second, we translate it in a way that's most compatible with our theological beliefs. But when you notice that, you see we have a problem. We want our theology to come from, in Luther's words, sola scriptura, from scripture alone. When we read the scripture, however, we can't help but read it through the lens of our culture, our preconceptions, and our religious beliefs. We all, including translators of the text, bring a lifetime of theological baggage with us when we try to understand the scripture. Now, we can do things to minimize this problem but there's nothing that we can do to avoid it altogether. We translate the Bible to be consistent with what we already believe the Bible says. But what if we're wrong? In the 1860s, there were ministers in the United States that argued that the Bible not only condoned slavery, but mandated it. Who could question the word of God, they asked, when it said, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, as in Ephesians 6, 5. Or tell slaves to be submissive to their man, uh, masters and give satisfaction in every respect, as in Titus 2.9. Well, I don't think that anything that I've said so far has been controversial. I'm about to go out on a limb, though. Now, I think the limb is pretty strong, and even if it breaks, I believe that you're gracious and won't trample me after I fall. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 10, uh, we're presented an all-too-overlooked translation problem. It's a list of various groups that Paul declares will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the New International Version and the English Standard Version both lump two Greek words. Those Greek words are malakoi and the other is arsenikoitai together, and they translate them together as men who have sex with men or those who commit homosexual acts. There are other plausible translations, though. Mal Malakoi may well refer to male temple prostitutes. And to be honest, I'm not sure that anybody has a good idea of what arsenikoitai means. As far as we know, Paul made the word up. It's used exactly twice in Scripture, here in, uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians 6 and, and another time in 1 Timothy 9. It's not used anywhere else in any ancient Greek literature at all. Um, so we don't have any other context that we can use to determine the meaning. It's a combination of two Greek words, one meaning man and the other meaning bits. So a very plausible translation, what I think is actually the natural translation of this, is promiscuous men. Well, that leads us up to this question. Does the Bible sometimes make you squirm when you read it? If the answer to that question is, re is yes, then rest assured it makes me squirm too. If the answer is no, then that prompts a further question. Why not? Whenever I become a bit too self-assured as I read the scripture, I recall the wisdom of Anne Lamott's warning that you can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. Now, I'm not trying to change your theology here. Being mindful of one of our cherished freedoms as Baptists, Bible freedom, the freedom of every believer to interpret the text for him or herself. 
So what am I trying to say? I'm saddened by those who, under the guise of defending freedom of speech, utter statements that are known to be offensive to adherents of other religions. For no purpose that I can see except just to give offense. I, I'm ashamed whenever I see groups like the Westboro Church, who are known more for hating certain groups of people than they are for loving God. I've had heartbreaking conversations over the years, especially during my time as an army chaplain, with people who have immediate, strong, visceral, negative reactions to finding out that I'm a Christian minister because they never felt anything remotely like love in their experience with Christians. So if you don't remember anything else that I say today, remember this. Do not let your interpretation of Scripture get in the way of your loving another human being. We, we believe that the Bible is the authority in matters of faith, and I'm not in any way questioning the authority of Scripture. What I am questioning is my own authority as an interpreter of Scripture. We are not God. So no human interpretation is inerrant. And every translation and every reading of the text is an interpretation. Don't give up hope, though. Although we can't say with absolute certainty that an interpretation is correct, we can be confident that there are some interpretations that are incorrect. In the year 397, St. Augustine gave us a key to interpreting Scripture in Book 1, Chapter 6, or 36 of his work on Christian doctrine, which is actually my favorite thing of all of Augustine's writings. The whole purpose of Scripture, Augustine said, is found in the two great commandments, to love God and to love our neighbor. So, he says, any interpretation that does not lead to the love of God or the love of one's neighbor is wrong. Of course, it's conceivable, he points out, that a wrong interpretation could lead to an increased love of God and neighbor. And here's where I show Augustine, or I think Augustine showed particular wisdom. He, he likened this to one who strays off the road and takes a rough trail to a destination. You didn't get there by the best route, but you got there, and that's what's important. Now, without question, there will be people with whom we disagree. Certainly outside, but believe it or not, even within our own walls. How should we respond to that disagreement? We should respond with humility, with grace, and above all, with love. Humility first, because I'm confident that God still has some lessons that he wants to teach us. Decades ago, I was blessed with absolute, unshakable confidence and complete certainty much like Peter was in Acts chapter 10, who thought he knew better than God about what was clean and unclean. Now, though, I've reached a stage in life where I'm willing to admit, at least to myself, if not to my wife, that I might just be wrong. Second, we should respond with grace, because grace has a way of transforming others when nothing else can. Third, we should respond with love, because to paraphrase Augustine, love has a way of getting things right even when our theology is wrong. Recall the scene in Huckleberry Finn when Huck decides to write a note to Mrs. Watson telling her where Jim, her escaped slave, is. Why? Because he's convinced that helping slaves escape is a sin and turning them in is the right thing to do. He then starts thinking about the times that he's shared with his friend Jim and picks up the note and the text says he was trembling because he was faced with an eternal decision between two things, heaven and hell. He thought for a minute, held his breath, and said to himself, all right then, I'll go to hell. He tore it up. Love has a way of getting things right. Uh, what does this look like? It looks like Jesus. Jesus, who in the first two chapters of Mark has eaten with sinners, he's violated the Sabbath law, and generally ticked off the religious establishment. It looks like his encounter with the leper in Mark 1. A leper came to him, begging him and kneeling. He said to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. And he said to him, I do so choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, he was made clean. Did Jesus need to touch the man in order to heal him? No, he could have done it without 
even saying a word. The man, though, needed to be touched by another human being. It's not just our bodies that need to be healed. It looks like Peter and John's encounter with the lame man in Acts 3, which uh, Jacob preached on not very long ago. When the man asked him for charity, the text says, Peter looked intently at him as did John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. The thing I love most about that story is when Peter says to the lame man, look at us. Can you imagine being lame from birth in that society, the shame, the sense that your life has no value, that you've been judged by God and found wanting? Yet Peter refuses to relate to the man under those terms. He forces eye contact to be treated as equals to recognize the humanity of the other person. How can I hate someone who was created in the image of God himself? How can I despise someone for whom Christ died? John states it pointedly. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are simply liars. To love Jesus is to love those whom Jesus loved. And to see someone who loves as Jesus did is to see the face of Jesus himself. Whenever I see someone make sure that a child has enough food for the day, I see Jesus. Whenever I see someone spend an hour with an elderly person who's been forgotten by all others, I see Jesus. Whenever I see someone who treats a developmentally disabled person with dignity and respect, I see Jesus. Whenever I see someone encourage a young woman to explore her sense of a divine call to ministry, I see Jesus. Whenever I see someone embracing a sobbing teenager who's been rejected by his or her family, I see Jesus. Whenever I see someone who stands up for those who cannot stand up for themselves, I see Jesus. And when we live like Jesus, maybe then Micah's vision will become a reality. And in that day, says the beloved, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away. See, some have been driven away by their own choices, and for that I grieve. I fear, though, that many have been driven away by the church's inability to love, and for that we can only repent. Perfect love indeed casts out fear, both in the one who loves and in the one who is loved. And if there is anyone who is afraid, afraid of how I will judge them, afraid that I will condemn them, afraid that I will despise them, then my love is not what it should be. Richard Vermbron, who was a Romanian pastor and held in prison and tortured by the Romanian secret police for nearly 15 years. In his book, Tortured for Christ, he said this, God will not judge us by how much we endured, but by how much we could love. That judgment is coming, my friends. So let's find out how much we can love. Amen. A good song of reflection is the hymn we sing, All Are Welcome Here. Let's stand as we sing and think about this song together.
a look at this and see if it's my turn again to say something. Um, oh, those are, she already did those. I think. <clears throat> You can tell I have no clue about what's supposed to be going on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right, okay. Receive this benediction. <laughs> Love knows no bounds. Hope knows no bounds. Peace knows no bounds. Faith knows no bounds. Go bring hope and peace. Live in faith. And above all, be love. Amen. And as we sing together. God be with you till we meet again, by his counsel's guide of hope.